I'm Trisha Perry for Vision of the Valley. We've been here at the Arms Museum in Youngstown many, many times. It was once the grand residence of all of Arms, but since 1964 when it became a museum, the second floor has been all exhibits. But don't think that this place is frozen in time. It's worth the visit because the second floor exhibits change. And we're here to talk to Jessica Trickett, who is the collections manager. Hi. Hi, Tricia. So you right now have this space right behind you that we're going to look at that you can change to different decorative arts, right? That's right. Uh, it's a dedicated decorative arts gallery, and our inaugural exhibit is Mid-Century Modern in the Mahoning Valley. Now, why did this change? First, tell me about how this became a, um, a gallery devoted to this. Sure. Um, well, one of our main benefactors here is Ann Kilcally Chrisman, who uh, was active in local arts and culture organizations for many years. Um, as a supporter of this organization, uh, she made it possible for us to dedicate a gallery specifically to the decorative arts, uh, which is the focus here at the Arms Family Museum. And um, one of the first exhibits. Uh, it made sense for us to do a mid-century modern exhibit because we have a great collection that represents that period here in the Mahoning Valley. And because that collection is so great, yet you didn't have enough space in the past to showcase this kind of thing, it's kind of a new, a whole new world opened up to you now, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're able to take our individual galleries here at the Arms on the second floor and explore some different unique areas of our collections and really kind of bring those to life. Okay, so this one, mid-century modern, is what years? And I want to see it, so let's Sure, yeah, come on in. So right away when we walk in, you can tell by this, yeah. what the style is going to be, and it kind of gives it, gives it a flair right off the bat. Yeah, right. The uh, mid-century design aesthetic was focusing a lot on um, both kind of natural forms and also futuristic shapes and, um, you know, optimism and looking forward. All of which you never would have seen in this house when all of Arms lived here. Yeah, absolutely. When, uh, when the house became a museum in 1964, uh, it really focused on both the history of the Arms family here in the house, but also the Historical Society's collections and a lot more about the pioneer history of the Mahoning Valley. Right, so now, as time has gone by, you do get things from people that look like they're from different eras and you have to save some of it. You save the best stuff. Isn't that kind of your job? That's right. I mean, when we do an exhibit, of course, it involves a lot of curating and kind of uh, deciding what uh, fits in best to tell a particular story. And with mid-century modern, it's all about um, manufacturing and how things changed as far as modern techniques and modern um, design principles that really kind of transform the way people were living and mass-produced furniture when right. before it wasn't quite like that. Yeah, exactly. So one of the things right here you can't miss, and some people might overlook because they think it doesn't look that exciting, this is a desk that was made here in Youngstown, right? That's right. Um, the General Fireproofing Company made this desk, and uh, it's called, the design of it is called the Italic Design Series, and it was, this particular model was right around from 1959. Um, and also used locally um, by R. Thornton Beagley, who was president of the Standard Slag Company. They moved their offices to the Stambaugh building in 1959, and so this was a focal point in his office at that point. Um, also, uh, General Fireproofing actually was an earlier company. They started in 1902 with focusing on business material or building materials and uh, then switched to office furniture a little later in their history. And my grandfather actually worked for, for them and retired from there. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> I can remember as a little girl him coming from, home from work at, at GF. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. And uh, yeah, a lot of, you know, employed a lot of local people. Um, their furniture uh, really was, you know, inter used nationally also. Right, mm -hmm. right. Um, so it's great that this piece was saved, and I, I can't imagine how, except it, was it in someone's personal collection? So we received this piece from Stancorp, which was a later version of the Standard Slag Company, and the company that had initially used this in their offices. Okay. I, I was going to ask if you maybe got it directly from General Fireproofing. As a reporter, I believe I covered when they closed and got rid of Okay. Well, we did actually uh, receive a large collection of pieces from General Fireproofing when they, you know, shut their offices down here. Um, mostly archival and archival collections, so I was able to dig through those when we were looking for, um, you know, supportive pieces for the exhibit, like mm -hmm. some of the graphics we've used on the walls and things. So you can definitely see Don Draper sitting behind this. <laughs> Absolutely. As we are all familiar with the style now that we've watched all those years of Mad Men. Yeah, it's and it's definitely back. come back into fashion um, over this, this last decade. Yeah, it's beautiful.
go into another kind of interior. This is a living room from the same period, right? Yes, that's right. Um, this really focuses on a couple of interesting local pieces, but um, more so just the um, design aesthetic of the period with uh, using bold colors and patterns and textures to create focal points in the space. So what are your top pieces in this that you would want to talk about? Yeah, so um, one interesting piece is just um, maybe the ubiquitous, you know, wool sofa that everybody might have had. <laughs> Davenport. Yeah, <laughs> like exactly. Would call something right, like that exactly. <laughs> this um, this was uh, used locally in uh, Boardman on Newport Drive and by a local family and, um, you know, just something that everybody can really identify with. Mm -hmm. I know some of these other things that I kind of recognize from my childhood, mm -hmm. um, but not so much my mother because she kind of did a whole colonial thing okay. going on. She was a little <laughs> bit not into this this era, but I do remember at my grandmother's house and a couple of other things that that looked very. You have all the colors. Yeah, going on. and you know some of some of the design trends that were really popular at the time um, were kind of, you know, might, might seem like they're at odds, but you have both natural forms, organic sculptural pieces, but then you also have futuristic space age pieces because that's, you know, what was really going on at the time. Like the land. The race for space, exactly. It's combining yeah. two things. There's like an animal. Exactly. And then, and then, then these this kind of drum, on. you know, yeah. shaped or, um, you know, saucer shaped pieces that were really kind of focusing on um, the space race and things. Right. Yeah. And then the the rotary phone, of course. <laughs> yeah, and then and you have a lot of low pieces too. Um, both, I think, were uh, reflective of the importance of the television in the modern, you know, household, and everybody needed to have a vantage point to the television. But also, um, another big important part of mid-century modern design was a connection to the outdoors and so you had these wide vistas to look outside in your neighborhood and your street and see what was going on and connect with your neighbors mm -hmm. and um, it was it's more about really informality and opening up and um, people kind of um, you know in, interacting a little bit uh, more informally. Is that a period dress? It is, that's from our collection as well. It's actually a paper dress and another one of the themes and modes of uh, mid-century modern is really about um, equality uh, social equality, of course, was becoming a big uh, topic of the day, and accessibility of instead of designers designing for the rich and famous, they were designing for everyday people. So paper dresses are actually made out of synthetic wow. uh, fibers, pulp uh, fibers, and you know made to be kind of disposable. So you see the transition from permanent to a more disposable society here. It's not terribly gorgeous. It's, it's drab, it's a little yeah. drab, but you know, it's made from paper. So you think about, yeah. you know. Yeah I, think, uh, yeah, I think you need someone in a cocktail dress that's real fancy <laughs> yeah, sitting Yeah, yeah, we could definitely go there too. And that's kind of the dichotomy of this period is that you have, you know, the Jackie Kennedy glamour, but you also have the, the real um, kind of more accessible everyday styles that ca became popular as well. Okay, and this television is from? Yeah, here? this is, um, where is the TV? It's a, yeah, 1950s Philco television. Um, so it's just, you know, your large floor model TV. A little later in the development of televisions because, you know, your original screens would have been a lot smaller than this one. Um, but just showing a little bit of the advance in television at this point as well. Yeah, the painting, um, we don't know if it's a local artist or not, but these, uh, there was a series of paintings done by this artist called R. Sutherland. A very mid-century in design with um, natural forms but also abstracted. You, you can see some fish and trees and then some geometric patterns in there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the earth tones, uh, this was all very much in keeping with the design aesthetic of the time. And some of these, uh, this painting in particular um, is from our Business and Media Archives WKBN collection. Mm -hmm. So I think it must have been at their office at right. some point. It yeah. looks very similar to the murals that were at the okay. yeah, yeah. you know, especially coming right in the front entrance. Yeah, yeah.
So this whole corner is actually one piece, right? It's one main thing that has been given to the museum and you really didn't have a place for it until now. Yeah, that's right. Um, this uh, whole set of uh, 1948 Youngstown Kitchen set became available uh, a few years ago. Um, it was actually brought to our attention at the Historical Society via people online who saw that this set was in pristine condition because most of it had been stored for decades and decades, never used. And um, so local people kind of rallied and um, specifically Michael and Jeanette Garvey at M7 Technologies um, made a way to purchase the set and bring it back here to Youngstown. Um, and bring it here to the Historical Society for us to be able to share with the community. And I remember when it first came, you know, you kind of have a space issue and you didn't know where to put it. So yeah. it was downtown for a while at the right. other, at the Tyler. Yes, we had it on exhibit for about a year at the Tyler. Uh, we loaned it to the Youngstown Historical Center of Industry Labor. They exhibited it for about a year and then it came back to us and we wanted to put it right back on exhibit because it's so popular, people really love it and connect with it because they remember it or they still have it in their kitchen. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the highlights here. First of all, I mean, those drawer pools are, are like screaming at me, yeah. everybody had those. Yeah, this... So we can start with the stove down here, the stove sure. and the drawer pools, everything is very much, it all matches. Yeah, well this, uh, the, the stove itself is a general electric stove, but you can see, um, obviously Youngstown Kitchens didn't manufacture that, but you can see the drawer pool style is very in keeping with what's going on at Youngstown Kitchens at the time as well. So they would have the stove and then they would have bought this whole corner set that yeah. goes through around the sink. And, well, and Youngstown Kitchens um, manufactured here in both Warren and Salem um, were, they had their system of sending salespeople out into the homes and being able to consult with customers to really create a custom kitchen. So these pieces, they could design however they wanted to fit in the space that they had. So you would pick how many, how big you wanted this, and then the drawers next to the sink. Give me some more features here. I noticed it looks like drain boards on either side. Yeah, you have you know the the dual uh, lower sink cabinet uh, with drain boards on either side, like you said. Um, you have you know drawer space and doors um, for access to your plumbing below. Um, then the upper shelves, you know, mm -hmm. for your picture window to look out. But then you have some accessories to be able to have some of your fun. Um, you know, knickknacks on display as well. Um, which goes around to the Yeah, it goes corner. around to our really neat uh, corner cabinet, which opens up to a Lazy Susan. Sure. So you're able to access all your pieces from the back as well. Um, the countertops on this particular set are um, a brand name called Cushin. And um, unfortunately, there was a design flaw in the system where the countertops would lift after time. So Cushin didn't really last in Youngstown Kitchen's repertoire for uh, for many years, and after that they went to other brands. Um, so this one lasted because it wasn't used, probably. Exactly. Yeah. This was, the majority of this collection was stored away in boxes, so it's new old stock. A couple of the pieces were used, and you can see some signs of wear, but uh, yeah. What I love about this is it looks just like my aunt's kitchen on <laughs> the south side of Youngstown, except mm -hmm. for her kitchen was a lot smaller, so she didn't have that. That she, the there was no room for that. Okay, yeah, so, the little Which is show. a great, great thing. That's a great Yeah, the show. display, the display pieces are just great because you can add your own character, you know, right. to the kitchen. She did have those, mm -hmm. and I can't even remember the things she kept on it. Uh -huh. And I think the countertop looked like that. So it's like, when I came in and saw this, I went, oh, Aunt Max. <laughs> yeah. It was Maxine. Brings back lots of memories. And her, it was this color, this the, green, yeah. the entire thing. <laughs> like she painted every piece of woodwork and everything this mint green color. Yeah. It was a big deal back then. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, those, you know, the colors, it, it kind of either could be, you know, earth tone based or very nice bright pops of color because mm -hmm. even like art movements of the time with pop art, um, you know, were bringing those bright focal points in, right. into focus. Right. So I see you have the ad from that. Yeah, well. we've got a great Youngstown Kitchen uh, archival collection at, um, oh, in our archives. So we were able to really source all of this material from pieces that have been donated to the uh, Historical Society's archives. So if this was made in 1948 till about when, when styles changed about? Well, um, the company itself, Youngstown Kitchens, 
merged with the American stand or Mullins Manufacturing, I should say, merged with American Standard in 1956. This sink set is from 1957, and it was actually used here at the Arms family home oh, in, in our kitchen. Yeah, and One of the only pieces that's probably like that modern. Yeah, right? from yeah, modern, but also you know from the service area of the house, which is great. We can see a little bit about you know how life was in the house at that point. Um, when the companies merged, the logo changed, so you had the American Standard um, faceplate instead of the Youngstown Kitchen's face, mm -hmm. faceplate um, of the past. Also, in the 1950s, you have the shift to Formica for countertops, mm -hmm. and the Youngstown Kitchen's brand name for that was called Moon Glow, so you have these different featured colors that were available on your Youngstown Kitchen's uh, countertops. Oh, wow. Yeah. Three of the colors there, at least. If yeah, more. some of them, um, and there are way, um, way more options um, that we can see here okay. as well. Um, this is a sales sample kit oh, I see, yeah. that the, peop the uh, salesperson would bring into your home and you could set up the design of your kitchen and also look at the countertop choices, um, be able to really customize your kitchen the way you wanted it. Look at the tiny little, it was like dollhouse yeah. furniture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was kind of, uh, I would think it would be kind of fun to be able to, you know, mix and match and choose what layout was oh, going to yeah. work best for your kitchen. Definitely. And all these different colors that were in at the time. Yeah. The dark yeah. red and the dark yellow. And you can see some of the different um, furniture drawer pools that changed over time and how the shapes changed and how that kind of reflected what was going on with both the, the chrome, you know, curvilinear style right. and then your boomerang space age styles, you know. Right, right. It's really wonderful. So where did these pieces come from? Were they also in the Youngstown Kitchen Collection? These were actually um, collected by a woman who worked for Mullins Manufacturing. She worked uh, for them both when they were Mullins and then after the transition to American Standard. And she just kept these with these? She, she liked them? Yeah, she kept them in store, you know, stored. Um, I don't know if she planned to use them or if she was just kind of keeping a, a record of, you know, her her work life and kind you know. of an odd thing to collect. You yeah, know? Like, well, let's well, collect countertops and different. But if colors. she hadn't, we wouldn't have it. So I know. It is an odd <laughs> God thing, bless the collectors. <laughs>so going over um, on the other side of these countertops I see colors I recall from my childhood like the harvest gold and the avocado green right this was wall covering or yeah we have um, a wallpaper treatment and then a couple of window shade treatments and um, you can see the the two the top two are the window shade treatments you can mm -hmm. see the top one has just a base stripe and then on top of that has been applied a fruit kind of um, collage oh, on the second mm -hmm. um, version of that. And then below is a more graphic floral pattern. And natural elements were very popular um, in mid-century modern design. Just um, the shift for, from kind of the fear of nature and the unknown to embracing the future and uh, the outdoors. And really, like these colors are sort of back in style now. I know for a long time, yeah. they were not. And if it was an avocado green color, everybody was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> but now those are really olive green and gold. Yeah, and everything old is new again. And mid-century modern, you know, not unlike other styles, you know, they, they tend to have a cycle that is popular for a while and then it'll shift to something else and come back again. So this must be a really fun job mm -hmm. to talk about people's collections or things that came from the past and yeah. also to decide what is important to keep and what isn't. Right. Is it a tough job? Is it a hard decision? Yeah, it can sometimes? be, absolutely, because um, you know we're trying to, to tell stories uh, without bias. We're trying to you know give a historic perspective, not only you know, from our own community standpoint, but the things that influenced us from outside as well and how that all kind of works together to tell a story of what, a, what it's like living here in the Mahoning Valley. Um, so yeah, we have to be uh, focused on 
what matters locally, but also through the context of how outside factors affect us here. For an exhibit like this, um, we wanted to focus on, not only on design, the overall aesthetic of the mid-century modern movement, but what that means to local design and manufacturing. And so we picked out pieces from our collection that really reflect what was happening here through general fireproofing and Youngstown kitchens, mm -hmm. you know. So it really does tell many stories. Yeah, all in one. absolutely. There are many levels to it because, you know, we want people to be able to come here and see themselves reflected in um, what they're seeing here. And, and maybe if they don't see themselves, they're learning something that um, they, you know, might not have known before. And it'll, uh, you know, engage them to dig a little further. And you do let it stay for a little while, like, so they have the chance to come. That's right. So they can come back. And usually when you come back, you see something a little different that you might not have seen before. And, uh, you know, it might just uh, create a new spark for you. So this totally dates me because um, as a child, I think our family had a crib very similar to this, <laughs> wooden with decals on it and that kind of thing. Tell me about the, the Plakey Nursery here. The Plakey Toy Company was developed locally um, right around 1940 when uh, Frank Hoover, who was an inventor uh, and actually initially sold gear ship knobs, he kind of switched gears uh, when his son was born in 1935 and um, his son found the the product samples fascinating um, and so Frank developed toys based on those concepts with uh, using plastic pieces and rattles and things for his son. And how did that shift into nursery items? So um, in the 1960s uh, Mrs. Dorothy Hoover um, uh, started designing a line of nursery gear um, based on a, a concept called the safe nap. Uh, she had designed this piece that had um, little bumpers that would keep a child, a baby, from falling out of its nursery crib, and then designed a whole line of nursery gear to coordinate with that and really fill a room with uh, bright colors and styles. So this one is yellow. That's right. <laughs> so this yeah, you can see this, this yellow gingham design that really has uh, multiple coordinating pieces and uh, was meant to really fill the uh, nursery space from top to bottom. With, and I see the safe now that is back there. That's right, yeah, yeah th with these little bumpers yeah. and you can see the baby uh, kind of being held, you know, from yeah. from any injury. It's kind of great that she thought of that mm -hmm. so long ago. Yeah. You know, here we thought that was a modern thing. Yeah. Um, no, this is it, this is beautiful and lovely and very familiar, which is another reason why it's nice that it's that's here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Plaky Toy, along with, you know, other iconic names, uh, really were important um, throughout the mid-century here in the Mahoning Valley. In fact, there are so many stories inside the Arms Museum to spark your memories, you really need to visit over and over. For hours and information, go to mahoninghistory.org. For Vision of the Valley, I'm Trisha Perry.